Welcome. Thank you for joining the Oklahoma Hall of Fame at the Gaylord Pickens Museum for Beyond the Book. The Oklahoma Hall of Fame preserves Oklahoma's unique history while promoting pride in our great state. Through each of its programs and the Gaylord Pickens Museum, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame honors our state's rich tradition by telling Oklahoma's story through its people. Oklahoma Hall of Fame Publishing is recognized as the leader in publishing Oklahoma's history. Over 180 titles published by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame celebrate the accomplishments and contributions of Oklahoma's native sons and daughters, institutions, and movements. In this edition of Beyond the Book, we're exploring Oklahoma, How We Got the Best Date Song. Moderating our session today is Vice President Jenny Campbell. Joining us is author Bob Burke. Oklahoma native Bob Burke graduated from Broken Bow High School in 1966, received a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Oklahoma in 1970, and a law degree from Oklahoma City University in 1979. He began a career in radio at the age of 15, and was a disc jockey, radio journalist, and sportscaster for Oklahoma stations KBEL in Idabel, KOMA, and KTOK in Oklahoma City, and ABC in New York City. Mr. Burke served in the administration of Governor David L. Boren, managed Boren's campaign for the United States Senate in 1978, and then established his law practice in Northwest Oklahoma City in 1980. Specializing in workers' compensation law and legislation. Among other numerous distinctions, he was honored as an Oklahoma County Pathmaker in 2002 and inducted to the Oklahoma Journalism Hall of Fame in 2003. In 2006, he received the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award from the Oklahoma Center for the Book. Bob Burke's biography of Bryce Harlow was named the Outstanding Oklahoma History Book of the Year by the Oklahoma Historical Society. In 2005, his biography of Ralph Ellison was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize and as an Oklahoma Reads Oklahoma Book selection. And his book about traveling Oklahoma timber towns was named Book of the Year by the Oklahoma Museums Association. Further, Mr. Burke has written more historical nonfiction books than anyone else in history. He was inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame in 2006. Welcome, Mr. Burke. We are also pleased to host the person responsible for this Oklahoma story, Governor George Nye. George Patterson Nye graduated from McAllister High School. Upon graduation, he spent a year and a half in the U.S. Navy at the end of World War II. When he returned, Nye attended Eastern Oklahoma State A&M, now Eastern Oklahoma State College, and earned a B.A. from East Central State Teachers College, now East Central University. He taught history in the local public school and, in 1950, while still a college senior, was elected to Oklahoma's House of Representatives. Nye became lieutenant governor for the first time in 1959 and became governor for a full four-year term for the first time in 1979. He was re-elected as governor in 1982, taking office in 1983. Nye has served as chairman of the Interstate Oil Compact, the Southern Growth Policies Board, the Industrial Development Commission, and the Tourism and Recreation Commission. He was also a member of the Southern States Energy Board Executive Committee. Nye has been recognized nationally by the United States Junior Chamber of Commerce as one of America's 50 outstanding young men. He is also a recipient of the National Martin Luther King Award presented by Coretta Scott King. After he left the office of governor, Nye served as a consultant to the McGraw-Hill School Division, was director of the J.C. Penney Company, joined the faculty of Edmonds University of Central Oklahoma, and eventually became its president from 1992 to 1997. Nye has served on the board of directors for IBC Bank and Sonic, America's Drive-In. 
Governor Nye was inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame in 1989. Welcome, Governor Nye. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. This is an exciting topic because I don't think there's any question that Oklahoma has the best and most well-known state song. I remember one time at a speech, I had made that statement, a guy in the back uh, stood up and said, no, sir, you're wrong. The most popular state song is the eyes of Texas. I said, sir, I've researched that. That's not your state song. That's the fight song for the University of Texas. And the state song, I told him what it was. He had never heard of it. <laughs> and I can't remember the name of it. I can't either. But hey, my hero is George Nye. Uh, I had such a pleasure starting about 22, 23 years ago, writing his biography. And what a magnificent life. No one has ever contributed more to this state than George Nye. And he has such a lovely bride, Donna. But the, one of the neatest stories is how Oklahoma got the great song. Why did you even like Rodgers and Hammerstein's songs uh, from the Broadway play? Well, sitting here, Bob, talking to you, <clears throat> excuse me again, thinking about my age now in 2020, as we're doing the interview, uh, I, back in 1941, excuse me, 1943, back in 1943, World War II going on, I was in high school and I was sitting up on the back porch at our home in McAllister listening to the Lucky Strike Hit Parade <laughs> where they played the top 10 songs in America. Number nine, da 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 da. Number seven, da da da. Number three, and then that drum roll, and I'm here doing my Spanish or my Latin, whatever I was doing. And they say the number one song in America is ba 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 Oklahoma. And I stopped, and I listened to it to Oklahoma, and I thought the number one song in the United States of America was about my state. Of Oklahoma, 1943 was on Broadway. Wow. Now, you you then moved forward in 1950. You're in the legislature. Yes. I, and and uh, and then in 1953, you decide to introduce the bill. Right. You're 26 years old. Yes. That's when we had a citizen legislature, truly. And you were teaching uh, history in high school in in, uh, in, McAllister. in McAllister. And so you introduced the bill to make Oklahoma the state song. What was the state song when you introduced that bill? Well, it was Oklahoma Hate Toast. Now, remember, we were a dry state. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Oklahoma a Toast. Okay. Uh, I give you a land of sun and flowers and summer the whole year. And it goes on. Yeah. And then to the <clears throat> to the chorus is Oklahoma, Oklahoma, fairest daughter of the West. Yeah, fairest daughter of the West. The word Oklahoma, the key words. Yeah. Oklahoma is the land I love the best. I will always sing her praises, but I have not said the half, so I give you Oklahoma. It's a toast we all can quaff. <laughs> Quaff. Quaff. <laughs> yes, but it was written by an Oklahoman. And so I decided the most popular musical in the world was Oklahoma, about our state. And it had been written as a Broadway show by with music by, by two great, you know, Rogers and Hammerstein. But it was adapted from a play from a guy named Lynn Rick from Claremore, Oklahoma. Yeah. And I thought that should be our state song, most popular song, most popular musical in the world. It seemed like the most rational thing, and it seems like it would be an incredibly popular thing. But, but Oklahoma yeah. became the state song, not without controversy. Not without controversy. It was, it was still people, so... I introduced the bill as a legislator. Keep in mind, I was the young. You know, You're young 26 legislator. years old. 26 years old, teaching Oklahoma history at McAllister. Uh, that in those days, the legislature only met every other year, so you had to have a job when you weren't in the legislature, yeah. and they asked me to teach Oklahoma history. But 
we, we had that song and it was so popular that I went to the, I thought that should be the most, that'll be the easiest, most logical bill in <laughs> Oklahoma history to pass that, make that the state yeah. song. Yeah. And now it's close we all can graph. Right. And uh, Mr. Huff, a state representative from Ada, Oklahoma, where I'd gone to college and knew him, but Mr. Huff opposed it. And the day it came up for the legislature to vote, Mr. Huff took personal privileges of the floor, meaning he could talk as long as he wanted to. And he said, you're gonna change our state song. In fact, he cried. Oh, yeah. He was speaking. In those days, the legislature, the House of Representatives only had one microphone and that was down front. <laughs> so Mr. Huff was, Representative Huff was down front and he said, you want to change our state song from Oklahoma, Oklahoma, to one written by two New York Jews who've never even been to Oklahoma. <laughs> And, and at that point in time, he started singing Oklahoma, Oklahoma, and he left the microphone and he walked among the legislators, grabbing them by their arm, making them stand, oh. and they started singing. And they're the singing song. the old song. Yeah. I, Oklahoma. <laughs> and, and I thought, man, I'm losing this. Yeah. So I got, when he finished his song, crying. Yeah. He was crying. I said, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent, we lay over, I ask unanimous consent that we lay over this House bill for one legislative day. And he didn't know what I had in mind, so he did not object. If he had objected. Yeah, it's over. If it had been over, they would have killed the bill. Yeah. And man, I got busy. Yes. Now, this is a wonderful part of the story, folks because George did not sit on his hands. <laughs> so so how, do the, how do you change the entire attitude of the Oklahoma House of Representatives? Well, first of all, I went to the state representative from Chickasha, where the Oklahoma College for Women is its name at the time. And I asked my friend, uh, do you have a choir down there that can sing Oklahoma? I said, we just did the play. Yeah, they had done that for the spring concert. Yes, we've yeah. just done the play for the spring concert. I said, I want them here tomorrow in gowns like Oklahoma. I want them on the floor. I want them singing songs from Oklahoma tomorrow. He said, I'll have them here. And then, of all things, I called a friend of mine that had gone to high school with me. He's a couple of years ahead of me in McAllister, Oklahoma, named Lynn, no, named Ridge Bond. And I called Ridge, who was selling real estate in Tulsa, but he had been the only Oklahoman yeah. to ever star as Curly on Broadway. That's right. And I said, Ridge, you still got any of that junk you wore when you were on Broadway? <laughs> he said, well, sure I do. And I said, put them on and get down here to Mar. Yeah. You're going to sing to the legislature. He said, yeah. with a choir from... Oh, Chicka Chicka Chicka. Said, yeah. when we're going to rehearse. I said, we ain't rehearsing. <laughs> you get down here. So the next day, I just got up. They, the choir came up and they got in a lounge where the nobody saw. Rich Bond stayed in there and he had all this stuff with a big belt buckle. Oh, yeah. Cowboy hat. Yeah. The, the, same, uh, the same uh, regalia that he had that he played on Broadway as his curly. And I brought the choir in from Chickasha, from OCW. And they sang, oh, what a beautiful morning, and chicks and ducks and geese, but yeah, they yeah. sang all these things. And then... Now, I, I've got to tell one the side program. here. The gallery was packed with, 300 with all the secretaries of the Capitol. George had been called by the o Daily Oklahoman the most eligible bachelor in the state. He's 26. He hadn't met Donna yet, okay? Okay. And so... And so all these girls in the Capitol who were Capitol secretaries jammed, literally, the gallery was full of all these fans of George. They were packed, standing <laughs> packed, over 300 people. Yeah. Well, they sang all these songs from the play, but had, then suddenly the piano, oh, I, ca I called... Uh, J um, Jenkins Music Company. I called Jenkins Music Store. Yeah big time store in Oklahoma City. And I said, you got any legislation you're interested in passing out here? And they said, well, as a matter of fact, we do. And I said, I'm for 
but I need a piano. <laughs> <laughs> Send me a piano tomorrow. Yeah, and yeah. It came out. Yeah. And they brought it in on the floor. Of the and house. they also brought some, uh, uh, what do you call those things that the choir stands on? They, Podium or no, no, no. Yeah. The, yeah. Anyway, they, they, yeah. Yeah, they, they brought that out. And anyway, suddenly the piano starts going boom, 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 boom. And Rich Bond from McAllister, Oklahoma, who had played Curly with his hands over his belt buckle, came in the door of the house. He kicked the door open with his cowboy boot. He said, oh, Oklahoma, where the wind cuts. And the choir started singing with him. And the crowd in the oh, audience, oh, yeah. you know, the 300 people in the yeah. balcony stood and cheered and I, and I put up there. And finally, all the members of the legislature stood and cheered. Yeah. Oklahoma, O-K-L-A-H-O-M-A, Oklahoma, OK, yeah. I said, Mr. Speaker, I moved passage of this House bill and it passed. It passed. I know. Because what could they do at that moment? All these legislators and, and, and Representative Huff voted for it. Oh, yeah. They all yeah, voted, yeah. Everybody voted for everybody it. Everybody voted for it. And what a wonderful story. In researching that, that incredible moment in, in 1953, when uh, that was passed, and then ultimately a few days later, uh, Johnston Murray signs the bill. Yes. Uh, when the Senate passes it, but there was no mention in the newspaper the next day. Yeah. That historic moment in history, somebody just missed the story. You would think that would be front page. We have a new state song, and it's this popular Oklahoma from the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical. It's not in the newspaper the next day. But then now. That, that, you know, as happens in the legislature, it has to go to the other body. There was no opposition in the Senate. It, it passes, it's it's uh, engrossed, uh, and then it's ready for Johnston Murray's signature. Tell us about that. Johnston Murray, <clears throat> strangely enough, just kept postponing signing the bill. And I said, <laughs> Governor, get it done. I'm going to McAllister back to my old hometown where I taught high school. It's the spring concert of the choir uh, the choral at McAllister, and they're going to sing Oklahoma. And I said, I want it to be the law that it's the state song. So that afternoon, he signed the bill and reached down and signed the bill and then reached up and gave me this very pen. Yes. Yeah. This is the pen in 1953. His name's on there. That Governor Johnston Murray signed the bill making Oklahoma the state song. So I took it, put it in a box, and headed to McAllister because that night I was to conduct the first official singing in my hometown of the new state song, Oklahoma. Yeah. And to this day, I still carry this pen with me because just think, Oklahoma, our state, was the most popular musical in the world for years and years. Yeah, it held the record for the Broadway. longest on Broadway for like yeah. 40 years. But I, I'll never will forget. But I need to ask you another question. I, let me ask you a okay. question. I asked when you wrote the, the article, how do you spell the name of the state, the play, Oklahoma? How do you spell it? The play has no apostrophe. Not apostrophe. No, no, I mean exclamation mark, not apostrophe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The yeah. name of the state, if you want to know how to spell the name of the state, is just O K L A H O M A. But the name of the play has an exclamation point after it. I'll tell that story because that's Oscar Hammerstein's wife, right? Yes. Yes, yes. this is a cool story. Don't get a list with this story. They yeah. adopted it. The play Oklahoma was adopted from a, a play written by Lynn Riggs of Claremore. Green, Green Grow the Lilacs. Green Grow the Lilacs. Which is not really a very and sexy. So they wrote all this yeah. music, Green Grow the Lilacs, and they opened off Broadway. And yeah. Nobody got excited. New Haven, Connecticut. Yeah. Then they went to Philadelphia, or they went to Boston. They, they opened several other places, and they would change the name of the play, and there was a way we go. Yeah. It's on the back of the Surrey with the fringe on top is a sign that says away we go as they ride off. Well, away we go didn't excite anybody. And Ridge Bond personally told me this story. Mm -hmm. He started in Oklahoma. So 
I take it as first off. He said they were sitting around one day saying, it's not exciting away we go. Green grow the lilacs, nothing's exciting. And said, Mrs. Hammerstein said, well, change the name of the play to Oklahoma. That's what it's about. And Ridge Bond told me that they asked in the meeting, what's exciting about Oklahoma? And someone, Mrs. Hammerstein, someone, Mrs. Hammerstein spoke up and said, put an exclamation point after it and call it Oklahoma in the name of the greatest musical in history at the time has an exclamation point behind it, Oklahoma. And I keep saying that's what we've been doing in Oklahoma all these years, you writing all those books, the Hall of Fame people, talking about people who have been successful, pointing out how if you put excitement, an exclamation point in your life, you can do wonders living in Oklahoma. Yeah. You don't have to go somewhere else. Yeah. yeah, we have done what Mrs. Hammerstein suggested, put an exclamation mark behind Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. What, a, what an incredible moment. It, 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 to me, to this very day, it's, it, let me just tell you a story that in all my life, as Lieutenant Governor particularly, I for 16 years worked on the image of Oklahoma worldwide and then as governor worldwide. And to me, this summarizes back to the state's hall. Of all things, when I was governor, five governors were invited to go to Tokyo <clears throat> to meet with Emperor Hirohito. Wow. Emperor Hirohito, who had been emperor of Japan when they bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941. And one of the things they bombed in Pearl Harbor was the USS Oklahoma. That's right. And I'm governor of Oklahoma and I'm invited to meet with Hirohito. But keeping in mind, General Douglas MacArthur convinced President Harry Truman, when the war was over, let Hirohito still be the emperor. Yeah. He didn't yeah. declare war. It was the, yeah. the, the, the legislature, the yeah. Congress, their government. He was just the emperor. Mm -hmm. He didn't really run it. It's kind of yeah. like the king or yeah. queen of yeah. England. Kind of like the royal emperor. family. Yeah. And he said, Jack, Japan needs somebody to rally behind. Mm -hmm. President, President Truman, leave Hirohito as the emperor. Well, in 1982, I'm one of five governors meeting with Hirohito. And they line us up, and I'm the, I'm the guy on number five, and he comes in way down there, kind of shuffling. He's aged a lot. and he's, he, he's, he was a really a little short little fellow, short wasn't he? Yeah. And here comes Hirohito, and I'm meeting him. And I'm the fifth governor he talked to. Out of the five, I'm the last one he shakes hands with. But his staff had prepared him to say something about each state that the, he met the governor. Oh, you're the governor of New Jersey. Yes, New Jersey spoke perfect English. Oh, you're the governor of California. Yeah, I had California. And so when it got to me, he said, I said, I'm George and I, he said, yes, you're the governor of Oklahoma. And I said, I'm the last one. He, I said, yes, I'm the governor of Oklahoma. And he said, well, when I think about Oklahoma, I think about oil and gas, we, corn, hay, cattle. And I said, yes, sir. And he Hito just turned and he's walking away. And I'm the only governor that he Hito turned back and said something else. He's walking away and he turned back and he said, great, musical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's like in 1986, uh, my partner and I settled a big lawsuit, took off a couple of months and went completely around the world. We're at a restaurant in Bangkok, Thailand, uh, in, or in a hotel restaurant, eating. And uh, my partner would always say, hey. So the girl came up, and, and, the, and my partner would say, we're from Oklahoma. She said, hey, we just did that play as our musical. We did it in English. So here's a, our waitress in a restaurant in Bangkok, Thailand, who had just completed Oklahoma. It's, it's been a worldwide phenomenon, 
but it would never have happened had you not felt fallen in love with the song sitting out on your porch. And then you come along as a young whippersnapper along, among all of these old legislators <laughs> and you kick out the old song and give Oklahoma the greatest song ever. It, it is, you know, everybody knows that song. Well, I was on a Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce economic development tour one time. We were in Italy and we were on a cruise. Chamber of Commerce, we were on a cruise and uh, we were in Italy, we were up on a, we docked down here and we went up on the side of an Italian mountain and eating lunch. <clears throat> we were all sitting there and this English guy from England, this Englishman came up to me and he said, you all look alike. You sound alike, you have the same accent, where are you from? And we said, Oklahoma. And he said, Oklahoma? Now this is in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> on the Mediterranean coast. Yeah. I said, yes, Oklahoma. He said, I feel like singing a song. And he went over and got his twin brother and they had on top, top hats and, and a cane. And the two twin brothers danced up and down in the restaurant and sang Oklahoma. <laughs> and, and the maitre d' came over and said, very nice, very nice. Now be seated and don't sing anymore. <laughs> but they sang Oklahoma. Uh, well, one time I went to Germany and called upon a plant, or a company that was considering opening their Western Hemisphere headquarters somewhere in America. And I went to Germany to say, come to Oklahoma. He had me out to his house. The CEO of the company invited me out to his house. And I went out for a reception and he was going to introduce me to his neighbors. And then we pull around a little curve and on the front porch were all these people dressed in Western outfits. And we pulled up and they, they were his neighbors who had all dressed up in Oklahoma costumes. Really? And they sang Oklahoma as I pulled up <laughs> into the driveway. In Germany. In Germany. <laughs> and he then announced they were going to put their Western Western Hemisphere headquarters in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Wonderful. Wow. Yeah. So wow. Oklahoma yeah. had a lot to do with yeah. us becoming so such a great state now. Well, and you know, we had come through the Depression. Oklahoma was hard, hard hit by the Great Depression. And I've always felt like that here, 15 years after the end of the Depression, of where literally our people were depressed, we lost many of our people. I thought the introduction of Oklahoma as the state song, as such a positive thing, I think that helped Oklahoma be proud. Oh, it, 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 it helped us worldwide. It made us identify, and, and they did a, but if you just think about Oklahoma as a musical being the most popular in the world, many places in the world had really never heard of Oklahoma until the stage, yeah. Yeah. The, the Broadway show. But it's exciting. And the, the story of the exclamation point to me is important. And I used, I, I, I generally, in, when I make a commencement speech, I said, remember the main thing about your life is to put an exclamation point behind it. As you go through life and you're doing something, put an exclamation point behind it, just like Rogers and Amnesty. Now, as the guy said in the floor of the legislature, two New York Jews. But it was an original play written by a guy from Claremore, Oklahoma. And one of its first stars was from McAllister, Oklahoma. And so Oklahoma is our image worldwide, exclamation. A number of years later, in the 1990s, uh, 1980s, all at once the state of Oklahoma receives a bill, a huge bill, Oh. Uh, for royalties uh, for using Oklahoma. Yeah. Because the, li the licensing agency in New York uh, sent, the, sent a huge bill. Now, Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma never had to pay for that because you had a certain letter. Tell that story. Well, 
strangely enough, I could not find my letter, but David Bourne, who had become U.S. Senator, found a copy of the letter and he talked to the people. But Rogers and Hammerstein's family, Rogers and Hammerstein and then their family, but when I introduced the bill, they promised me that as long as it was the official state song of Oklahoma, there would be no charge for any royalty any time Oklahoma had the song Oklahoma play. Yeah, yes, such a neat deal. So of course that licensing company said, okay. Yeah. And then I, I remember a news conference or something, I've seen a picture of where uh, one of the members of the family, uh, yes. uh, Senator Bourne paid a dollar. Yes, paid and a as official consideration, <laughs> paid a dollar, and then there was a contract that yeah, forever <clears throat> anyone <throat> can perform Oklahoma free. It, it's amazing that what, what happened for the image of our state. Yeah, yeah. It was a positive, positive thing. We needed that. Yes. We needed that. We needed it. It was a wake up call. <laughs> okay, yeah. Got a question from the audience. Okay. okay. As an OU alumni, I'm happy that you mentioned the eyes of Texas, especially as the song's racist origins have come to light. Looking back, how has the selection of Oklahoma as the state song aged? How, how has it aged? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it, well, there's certainly nothing in, in the song Oklahoma that, in my opinion, that ever uh, criticizes anyone. No. It talks about our land. It talks about the wind, you know, coming. It talks about the, the great qualities of Oklahoma. Uh, now, if anything, it, it perhaps led to people who had never been to Oklahoma later on uh, to think that we still were cowboys and Indians, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, but, but <clears throat> Oklahoma has stood the test of time. And I don't think that it, it has any negative qualities to any segment of our population. I don't think it does either because uh, it, it's just so exciting, so positive, so sweet, so loving, you know, uh, oh, what a beautiful morning yeah. and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. I think it's uh, very positive. I, I don't think there's a, a current negative image of Oklahoma, period, yeah. from yeah. the play or the song. But that questioner is certainly right about the eyes of Texas. I think they've taken that away. But that old boy years ago, he thought that was the state song down there. And I said, nope. <laughs> hey, here's another question. Did everyone accept the change of the state song in 1953 or did more general acceptance come after the film was released a couple of years later? Well, I, I think it, it came, most of it was positive from the very day that the bill passed. Uh, it, uh, of course, took a while to be, there were some people who were in history that remembered that the original state song was written by somebody who lived in Oklahoma and, <clears throat> And this play was written by two New York, New York Jews, but uh, that that went away very quick. It, it all became very positive. And if you just think how many more performances than almost any stage production in history yeah. uh, and around the world. Yeah. In and, fact, I, I know when we did the book, uh, somebody, some organization in New York said that this play had been in high schools and in and in colleges and in uh, community groups, that this that the over the last seventy five years that Oklahoma had been uh, had been uh, as a program in these institutions more than any other song. Yeah, South you, Pacific was number two. Yeah, if you just <laughs> stop and think, I'll go back to this pen again. Several times I was invited to, out, to come out of state to a university and conduct the final of Oklahoma. They would perform Oklahoma, then have me come up and can conduct oh, the final. Yeah, yeah. That, that nation. So that's been your baton since 1953. 1953. <laughs> and just around the world, this positive image of Oklahoma. Now, there were some at the time, but that 
that opposition is long gone because that was historical. And so since 53 on, people didn't remember even that song, yeah. but they will never forget yeah. the oh, song yeah. of yeah. Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, and there again, the movie became number one in the world. The stage production was number one in the world. The movie was number one yeah. in the world. And uh, it's just amazing how successful that our state has been. And that's the image we have. And I don't think it's the image of cowboys and Indians. I think it's the image of excitement mm. and positive love uh, yeah. for your fellow man. And I think it's been very positive. Now there, of course, was always something negative on any subject you want to bring up. So that's not unusual that somebody would be opposed to it. You know, the original Oklahoma obviously was such a romantic place. Yeah. It's about <laughs> romance. It's about excitement. It's about competition for the woman. But, uh, you know, in the revival of Oklahoma, uh, oh, 10, 15 years ago, it, it, they changed it up some. Yes, they did. Yeah. And it was, I didn't think it was as well done as the original production. Well, I, I don't either, but I, I think it's exciting when Shirley Jones comes back to talking about the movie. She'll come back to Oklahoma and once she comes back to OC, oh, oh Triple C, she yeah. was down there. Yeah. And uh, she and I were on the stage before they showed the, the rebirth of the movie, yeah. Oklahoma. Yeah. And she, she and I were talking about Oklahoma and, all, and it was so much fun to have her. And she just said, and that was the first movie Shirley Jones yes, ever that was, was in. Her. Yeah, that's right. And it made her a big time star. Yeah. The music from Oklahoma yeah. made her a star. Yeah. It's it's amazing. Here's a couple more questions from okay. the audience. Did Lynn Riggs live to know Oklahoma became the state song? I, I can't answer that, but I don't think so. Okay. I'll Google that while we're okay. <laughs> okay. Here's another one. And you addressed it a little bit about how you felt when you thought you were going to receive opposition, when you received the initial opposition, when you presented the bill. But what made you believe that you can make it happen? What inside you made you, pushed you through? Well, I thought the day when, when Mr. Huff cried on the floor of the legislature that he had captured the emotion of the House of Representatives. And it was sad and he was crying. And it was historical. And it was, it, it, he was a very popular man. I was just this basically second term new kid in the legislature. And I didn't have the friends that he had, the old timers that had run the state. And I thought, what I need is the dramatic change from this sad, crying song of singing, Oklahoma, Oklahoma. I need the excitement of Broadway. And I said, the only way I can get this crowd excited about the changing the state song is to have someone that knew about that song and could put the excitement in it. And my friend, Bridge Bond from McAllister, <laughs> star Curly of Broadway, yeah. Yeah. and the supplier yeah. from OCW, I said, get them in here. Yeah. And when they walked in and they started singing the songs from the, there was not a tear in the crowd. There was no one crying. There was no one saying, oh, this is terrible. There were people standing and cheering yeah. and raising their hand. And when they did Oklahoma, okay, yeah, almost every member of the legislature went, yeah. <laughs> you know, the other thing, I'm doing that. I, I apologize for it, but there's another interesting story that I think fits for the people to know. On Broadway, on Broadway, when they wrote the song, and here's the original song from Broadway. I had this, got it from a history center. Here's all the songs that they sing and all that sort of stuff. But what's exciting is to know that, that everybody was singing and when they sang Oklahoma, you're doing fine, Oklahoma, Oklahoma. Okay, yeah, that's the end of the, but when they wrote this play, 
that wasn't the end of the play. Mm -hmm. The song Oklahoma appeared early. Yeah, it was in the middle of the show. In the, in yeah. the play, yeah. in, the, in the show. In, on Broadway in downtown New York City. In the second act or the third, when, whenever it was, that the first time they sang Oklahoma, the crowd in the audience, when they started playing Oklahoma, would stand and sing with them and do that. Yeah. And Broadway started coming out before the show started and said, now, ladies and gentlemen, I know you're excited about Oklahoma and they're going to sing it early in the program, but please do not stand. Please do not clap. Please do not cheer. Please do not yell until we play it at the end of Broadway. And just think for years, for years on Broadway, they had to tell people that when they're singing about Oklahoma, do not stand, do not cheer, do not yell, do not be excited. And I'm saying, do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and By the way, Lynn Riggs did live. He died in New York in 1954. Okay. So, so he, he would did. have known yeah. about you introducing the bill and Oklahoma becoming the state song in 1953. I'm glad to know that. I, yeah. I don't. But he, I, did, he didn't die till 1954. Yeah. But just think about, there's something to think about. We're talking about a play written by a guy from Claremore that became the most popular program in the world. <clears throat> and just think, just ahead of Lynn Riggs was a guy named Will Rogers. But both Cherokees, because both Lynn Riggs' Cherokees. mother was Cherokee. From they Rogers lived on a farm County. outside of outside of Claremore. And Will Rogers, who was, now let's picture this, at the same time, was the most popular star on Broadway. He was the most popular movie star in the world. He was the most popular columnist because he wrote a weekly column in newspapers around the world. And he was the most popular in the world radio commentator. He was number one in four different areas worldwide from Claremore, Oklahoma. Yeah. And so I'm just saying, we need to get excited. That's right. And that's why I'm so proud of you, Bob, for writing all those books. And when they announced and introduced you and said that you've written all these books, I think it's important to say they're all about Oklahomans. That's right. They're not about people around the world. Yeah. That you're, you're in the Guinness Book. Hey. Right? Yes. But, but Oklahoma's story has all never been about places and events. It's always been about the people, our people, of George Nye somehow getting excited about this song and introduces a bill that gave us our state song. That's a, one of the coolest stories in state history, I think. Well, I think also I like to say that I've seen where of all the state songs in the nation, the most popular state song in the nation is Oklahoma. Yeah. You know, because when you grow up in Oklahoma, very early, you know that Oklahoma's the state song. Yep. Most people in other states have no idea what their state song is. Yep. I've got a couple other questions. Oh, okay. Um, this is the second book that you all have worked together on. Good Guys Wear Hats being the first, okay. which was Governor Nye's biography. Do you have plans to work on anything together in the future? And then also, Bob, what else do you have in the works? Tell them about the title of the truth. <laughs> no, no, no. We've talked about this in the last couple of weeks. I, well, fact, Governor fact. Nye has so many stories, even though I'm his biographer. <laughs> every time we have lunch, he'll tell a story that I've never heard. You know, it's amazing. More stories than anyone. He is the modern Will Rogers. And so there are some stories that need to be told that are not in his biography. And what are we going to call it? Well, first of all, I want to point out that I call them my B-square friends. B-square, yeah, Bob yeah. Burke and Bob Blackburn. Yeah, Bob Blackburn's going to help us with this. He's told, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who's just retiring right now as the director of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Historical. So we have the director of the Oklahoma Historical Society. We're here today in the Hall of Fame. And, yeah. the, and, the Heritage. and so we're talking about history in the past and who's contributed so much. And <clears throat> having been in government and politics, 
so long. I'm, I'm, I've decided that the name of the next book, and I've talked to my B-square friends, Bob Burke, Bob Blackburn. <laughs> I want the next book, the three of us, to write it, and I want it to be called The Truth, The Whole Truth, and Nothing But The Truth, Best I Remember. <laughs> Because, you know. And those are those, those collections of stories. Yeah. And it's best I remember because I, I remember details, but I'm not. I don't, I, <laughs> like, I, we were trying to, I was trying to tell you where Reba McIntyre was born. And I said, Hochatown. Well, of all things, I'm talking to Bob <laughs> Burke, who was from Hochatown. That's right. And Reba McIntyre is from. Chalky. Chalky. Yeah, yeah. And right. I said, Hochatown. I just yeah. messed up. <laughs> But just think of all the famous Oklahomans that have come from every oh, little we, nook and cranny yeah, and large yeah, city. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and and I, I, as you know, Jenny, since you have edited so many, uh, <clears throat> Jenny's the greatest editor in the whole world. And um, I have, um, let's see, Robert Henry and I have a book coming out pretty soon, a, a biography of Oklahoma's first two United States senators. Uh, Robert uh, Owen, who is known as the father of the Federal Reserve, and then and then Thomas P. Gore, Gore Vidal's grandfather, who was the only blind man who ever served in the United States Senate. Now, let yeah. me interrupt you. Uh -huh. Tell me what's the most interesting thing about our first two United States senators. The most interesting thing? <clears throat> well, they were both from the same town. From Muskogee. Oh. No, no. Well, okay. Yes, yes. Weren't they? Were they the yes, first ones? they were, except uh, Robert Owen early in life had gone to Muskogee and was an Indian agent. Okay. And so there was an agreement. Actually... Maybe I had the two... But I, we had two U.S. senators from Walton yes, at the same time. But there was a gentleman's agreement that these days would not hold up. The gentleman's agreement was that, look, no matter who, it's a popular election, we're having an election, first election... It doesn't matter who's number one and two. We got to have one senator from Eastern Oklahoma and one from West. Okay, so Excuse so me. Indian Territory, yes, and Oklahoma, Oklahoma Territory. So so Robert uh, Owen from Muskogee ran first. Okay, then another guy whose name whose name it literally he's evaporated into history, for me anyway, ha ran second. He should have been our first United States senator. But the gentleman's agreement, Tom Gore ran third. And so, okay. so the guy who runs second, who I can't even remember his name, was not, even though he polled second in the statewide vote, he lived up to his handshake agreement that there have to be one from East, one from okay. West. And so that's why, just wow. And, and that's, that's a wonderful story. I have, uh, I wrote the last chapter this weekend, Jenny, in the biography of a Tulsa Central High School graduate named James Woolsey, who was director of the CIA and the Clinton administration, yes. under secretary of the Navy before that. You see him on the cable news networks all the time. But I had talked to Jim last Saturday. And, you know, President Trump has just uh, pardoned Michael Flynn. Well, turns out that Jim Woolsey from Oklahoma was in a meeting with Flynn early in that Trump campaign and was so disturbed by it that Jim Woolsey really is kind of the person who alerted at the time uh, Vice President Joe Biden, Michael Flynn is trouble and he's doing some things that perhaps are, are illegal. Now, Michael Flynn was, a, was the national security advisor who only lasted the first 22 days because he had not disclosed to Vice President Pence that even when he was the security advisor for the Trump campaign, he was a paid, uh, he was being paid by the Russians to, you know, to, to work on some projects. Uh, not, not the Russians, I'm sorry, the Turks. He was, the, he was working for the <laughs> Turkish government to, anyway. So it's an interesting last chapter. So I was so inspired by my talk with Jim that morning uh, is that I, I wrote the last chapter. That and then a wonderful biography of Tim Leonard, longtime federal judge, 
former state senator. You were interviewed for that book. Uh, you were great friends. You were governor when he was in the state minority leader. Minority I was a, leader I was a Democratic state governor, and he was the Republican. And you, but y'all got along perfect. And we we worked together, and yeah, we did yeah, wonderful yeah. things. Uh, Tim, I uh, judge Leonard. As lawyers, we don't call federal judges by their first name, but incredible guy, still alive, of course, has taken senior status. But I think that's a wonderful book because he's from Beaver. And so it really, the first two chapters are really a comprehensive history of the panhandle, which is, which is very, very interesting. What else am I working on? Uh, Rob Ross, Bob Ross and I are doing a biography of Edith Kenny Gable. Okay, um, I, I've already signed on to do a biography of Hal Smith from Ardmore, wonderful restaurant tour. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, at age 30 without a college degree was president of Chili's. Just, but a really neat story. Uh, Governor Bill Anatubby of the Chickasaw Nation has agreed that I can write his biography. Now we got interrupted by COVID on so many of those personal interviews, but I've always got five or six really good projects going on at any one time. And I'm gonna write a children's book, I told Jenny this morning, about a guy named Clarence Nash from Watonka. When I do speeches, I'll say, anybody ever heard of Clarence Nash? Unless you were raised in Watonga, nobody ever raises their hand. Clarence Nash was a young man who in high school in the 1920s in Watonga, People made fun of him all the time because he was trying to talk like his pet goat and other farm animals. So they made fun of him. He goes to Hollywood and in 1932, Walt Disney hires him as the first and for 50 years, the only voice of Donald Duck. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't know this. Well, I learned it about 25 years ago and I, I spoke to a uh, like a Chamber of Commerce annual banquet or something in Watonga. And I said, anybody here of Clarence Nash? None of the young people did. But there were two elderly ladies in the back who had gone to school with Clarence. And they said, oh yeah, we know all about that. So I pledged the first thousand dollars for a, for a uh, sculpture, uh, that a bronze sculpture that is now on Clarence Nash Boulevard in Watonga. Great. Of Clarence holding uh, Donald Duck, because he was nicknamed Ducky Nash. I think one of the reasons that we've never known about him in Oklahoma is that he never came back to live here, but he died like in the 1980s when he was 50 something years old. So he died before we ever really were able to honor him at all, you know, you know. By the way, Lynn Riggs is, of course, in the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. We talked about Lynn Riggs a while ago. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left and two questions left um, from those tuning in. One asks, how many terms did you serve as governor, including your briefest term? And what was so unique about your briefest term? Well, I'll get carried away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very proud that I'm the first governor ever reelected in Oklahoma history. And that sounds so important. They'll introduce me. He's the first governor. It sounds so important. We became a state in 1907. And I was the first governor ever reelected. Well, what I didn't tell people, well, I was first reelected governor because it didn't, it was unconstitutional. You could not legally serve two terms <clears throat> until the Dewey Bartlett administration. In the people of Oklahoma, we changed the Constitution. You could succeed yourself. And Governor Bartlett lost to Governor Hall. Governor Hall lost to Governor Bourne. And then Governor Bourne did not run for re-election. And I was Lieutenant Governor. And I said, pick me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so two times while I was Lieutenant Governor, I was Lieutenant Governor four terms, 16 years. And people say, he's the longest serving Lieutenant Governor we've ever had, 16 years. I said, wait, wait. We have a lieutenant governor from Stillwater that served 20 years. James Berry. James Berry, 20 years as lieutenant governor because back in those days, the lieutenant governor was not a full-time job. He was president of a bank in Stillwater. <laughs> He'd just come to the Capitol every once in a while. Highway patrolman would drive him down here to the Capitol, 20 years. But I, I think that um, 
What was interesting is that when I was elected lieutenant governor, I was the youngest lieutenant governor in the nation. The man elected governor was Governor Edmondson, Howard Edmondson, and he was the youngest governor in the nation. Our state treasurer that was elected that year was from Pawhuska. He was the youngest state treasurer in the nation. <laughs> we were all kids. <laughs> and uh, yeah. anyway, so January, I ran for governor. Howard Edmondson could not run for re-election, so I ran for governor to succeed him. Well, I lost, which I'm glad I did because that's when I met Donna and we got <laughs> married and I had a run. If I'd been elected governor, I'd have never met Donna. Yeah, that's right. So that's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Lose the race for governor, meet Donna. But anyway, January the 1st, 1963, with five days or nine days left, nine days left in his administration as governor, Howard Edmondson, there was a problem that we had in Oklahoma, New Year's Day, OU was playing in the Orange Bowl. Mm -hmm. And I got a, I was Lieutenant Governor. I was at home with my parents and McAllister to celebrate New Year's watching the OU football game. And I got a phone call from a reporter, John Griner, the Daily Oklahoman. What do you think about Senator Kerr's death? I said, what? U.S. Senator Bob Kerr from Oklahoma died January 1st, 1963. Well, I'll move on then. The governor has the power to appoint the, somebody to take the United States Senator's place if there was a death. Howard Edmondson resigned as governor of Oklahoma under the constitution the lieutenant governor becomes governor. So after his funeral, after, after Bob, Bob Kerr's funeral, after Bob right, right. funeral died, President Kennedy came here to Oklahoma right. City for the funeral, but after the funeral, Howard Edmondson resigned. I became governor, and I appointed Howard Edmondson to the U.S. Senate. But anyway, I became You were governor. single, yeah. and you had 14 days. You served out 14 days. No, I served out nine days. Was it? No, no, you're right, nine days. But you had all of your nieces and nephews, didn't you, yes. come into the mansion? Well, <laughs> since I had run for governor during the campaign, I tried to get my relatives to support me. So I promised all my nieces and nephews that the first thing I'd do is governor would have a family reunion at the mansion and invite all the grandkids to come yeah. and spend the night in the yeah. mansion. All these little young campaign for me. Well, I became governor yeah. for nine days. And I said, my family's coming in here to the mansion. And I wanted a reason I could live in the mansion. I said, well, I got to keep my promise. Oh, yeah. So that was your first term as governor. Now, yes. So it was for yeah. nine days. That was my first term. And then I had not, not been... Governor, I lost the election. Then later, I became governor again. Uh, I ran for governor in 1978 because um, uh, David Bourne did not run for re-election. He ran for the U.S. Senate, so I announced for governor. But under the U.S. rules, what you have is seniority. And in the case of Howard Edmondson, he wanted to resign so he could get to be a senator earlier than the normal induction. So he would have seniority in the creation or in the appointment to any senatorial committee. But David Bourne wanted to be reappointed immediately, not that he could be appointed early, but he wanted to be appointed so he could take office mm -hmm. when everybody else did, so they wouldn't have seniority over him. Right. So he left five days early. Five days early. So You're I was, lieutenant governor. You become governor again. Yes. So <laughs> twice. So I've served four times officially. <laughs> I'm four-term governor of Oklahoma. Nine days, five days, then eight years. Yeah. Wonderful story. Yeah. But, you know, there is, there would be some legal question because in, before all that, we had lieutenant governors. We had two governors removed from office. But they ruled that the attorney, the lieutenant governor became governor. So when the election came, they could not run for re-election because the Constitution said you can't serve yeah. two terms as a governor. Yeah. And here I served four times. Yeah. I think that's constitutional. I have one more question, and then Donna will roll us out of here. 
In retrospect, including the bill naming the new state song, is there any other bill that you authored that you believe had as great an impact? Well, <clears throat> I would say, well, not that I introduced because I later became Lieutenant Governor and I got the legislature. And as Lieutenant Governor, you were President of the Senate. Yes. That's our Constitution. Yes, I was President of the Senate, but I got the legislature to give the Lieutenant Governor a full-time job. And I think as one of the most significant things I did before I ever became governor was to create the position of a lieutenant governor to have a job, to have something to do. Now just think, just think. For 20 years, we had a lieutenant governor, president of a bank, a nice guy. He was a heartbeat away from the governor's office. Yeah. He was on one state agency and he was president of the state Senate, but the state Senate adopted a rule creating the president pro tem. And if they de decided to go into executive session or pro tem session, the Lieutenant governor had to leave. So he didn't even have to be in the Senate anytime. So I would think as Lieutenant governor, one of the greatest things I got was to get the legislature to pass the creation of a tourism and recreation bill to take the state parks and the state lodges and the promotion of the state of Oklahoma and make it nationally the number one thing that at that time that the lieutenant governor's job was. And that way it didn't interfere with the governor's job. Yet, yet as a full-time person being at the Capitol all the time, if something happened to the governor, the lieutenant governor would have been prepared. You would have been prepared. Yeah. And and that's why when I appreciate the fact that governors then started inviting me into the budget meetings. The governor then started and the Senate started letting me preside. Oh yeah. Uh, they still they got me involved. But just think when I became lieutenant governor in 1958, 1959, when I took over, the lieutenant governor's heartbeat away. Mm -hmm from the most powerful job in Oklahoma, had a half-time secretary, shared his office with three state senators, had no assistant, had no press secretary, had no security, nothing. Yeah. And before me, the Lieutenant Governor Cowboy Pink was the first Lieutenant Governor that even had a car. Yeah, Cowboy Pink Williams. Yeah, the Lieutenant Governor had nothing, but twice, they removed a governor from office and the lieutenant governor became governor without any experience. Yeah. And so I, I, I think one of the things I'm most proud of as lieutenant governor was to create a full-time job for the lieutenant governor. Okay. Well, on behalf of the officers, directors, and staff of the Hall of Fame, thank you all so much for being with us.